Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Seth Ron Olive, and today we're doing something a little bit different. This is the first Brewer's Minute. So this is a new series I wanted to try. People have been asking for some more brewing stuff, brewing tips, uh, things like that. So Brewer's Minute is my attempt to kind of work some of that into the channel. So today we're talking about a new card from Kaladash. This is Gurupur Ori, a four mana artifact that does a bunch of things. It lets each player play an extra land on each of their turns, and at the beginning of each player's upkeep, if they got zero cards, they get to Ancestral Recall. They draw three cards. So what we're talking about today is symmetrical cards, and Gurupur Ori is a symmetrical card, and I think that these cards are some of the hardest cards for new players and new deck builders to figure out, because when you just read them over, one of the first things you think is, well, yeah, that's cool, I like playing extra lands, I like drawing cards, but it does it to my opponent too, so how good is this really over the course of an actual game of Magic? Isn't it just kind of putting things at parity? Why am I actually going to win the game because I'm playing Gura Per Ori? And this is an obvious thing to think. One of the biggest examples and clearest examples of a symmetrical card that is very easy to overlook as a new player or a new deck builder is Upheaval. I overlooked this card. I just didn't get it. Return all permanents to their owner's hands. Yep, so it like resets the game for six mana. Uh, I guess that's cool. I mean, sort of like a weird wrath effect. What does that really do for you, though? It wasn't until I saw it played against me and kind of thought about it that I realized the true power of Upheaval evil and with symmetrical cards what you're doing is exploiting a knowledge gap essentially so when you play upheaval you know you have upheaval in your deck so you build your deck in a way to take advantage of upheaval probably by playing a lot of mana sources birds of paradise noble high arcs mana rocks and your opponent they don't know you have upheaval, so they don't build their deck in that way. So how upheaval works in practice is you play all these mana sources, get up to 10, 12 mana, cast upheaval with a bunch of mana floating, and you can immediately replay your Birds of Paradise, your Mana Rocks, while your opponent, since they didn't know upheaval was something they should be building around, untaps, plays a single land, discards a bunch of the stuff you bounce back to their hand and passes the turn. So when you untap on your turn after upheaval, you're going to have like four or five mana on the battlefield, maybe even more than that, when your opponent has one mana. So that's how you break the symmetrical effect. So that's what we're going to be trying to do with Gura Per Ori. So the, the thing with Gura Per Ori is you can't build a Gura Per Ori deck that says your opponent won't get any benefit from it. Your opponent is going to play multiple lands some turns with Gura Per Ori. They are occasionally going to draw cards with Gura Per Ori. So the idea is to shift the math so even though it's benefiting both players, it's benefiting you more. So there's three ways you can do this with Gura Per Ori. Let's look at the first one using the first ability, playing an extra land each turn. So the simplest thing you can do is just play more lands than your opponent. If your opponent's playing a mono white deck with 20 lands and you're playing whatever deck, but it has 28 lands, you are going to play an extra land almost every single turn. So you're getting ahead on mana. Your opponent, maybe they play an extra land every other turn, every third turn. So even though your opponent is still getting some amount of benefit, you're getting more benefit out of the Ori. Plus, you can play lands that do things, and your opponent isn't going to know this. If you're making an extra land drop each turn, and your lands can produce creatures, or they can kill creatures like Blighted Fen, your opponent probably wasn't planning around making a bunch of land drops, so you can use the extra mana to use your lands to actually do something. Plus, you can put big fatties in your deck that your opponent may or may not have. So sometimes your opponent will also have Emrakul, or Elder Deep Fiend, or Ulamog, but in a lot of matchups they won't, so you're making extra land drops more consistently than your opponent, and you also have a better way to take advantage of your extra land drops with these big, huge Eldrazi that can win the game. So step one, the first thing you can do with Gurper Ori is play more lands and make sure you have payoffs for having more lands, and even though your opponent will benefit to some extent, you will benefit fit more from Gura Per Ori. So the second ability is probably the most interesting one on the card because 
drawing three cards is incredibly powerful. So if you can draw three cards more often than your opponent can draw three cards, it doesn't take too many activations of Ori to win you the game. If you can get ahead by two activations, say, that's six extra cards, that's likely enough to win you a lot of games. That's like a Sphinx's Revelation with nine lands on the battlefield. So... Again, you can't keep your opponent 100% from ever drawing cards with Gur per Ori, but you can build your deck in a way to make sure that you are getting more advantage out of it. So there's two ways to do this. Step one is you kind of ignore your opponent. Sure, they will draw cards some amount of the time, but you make sure that you are drawing cards every time by playing things like Noose Constrictor, Olivia's Dragoons, Haunted Dead, Collective Brutality, basically ways to get your hand empty. So... The way this would work out, say Gura Per Ori's on the battlefield for five turns, if you go with this plan, the idea is going to be that you will draw cards every single turn with it. You will always get empty-handed at the end of your opponent's turn, using your Noose Constrictors, Olivia's Dragoons, getting Haunted Dead back from the graveyard, getting the Spear Token, discarding cards. So you get empty-handed every single turn, so every single turn you are going to get that Ancestral Recall. And your opponent probably won't be able to get advantage out of Gur per Ori every turn. They will some turns, but let's say out of five turns, you get all five draws. So you're drawing 15 cards. Your opponent, maybe they get two draws, so they're drawing six cards, or three draws, so they're drawing nine cards. Yes, your opponent's getting an advantage, but you're coming out way further ahead. You're still gaining six cards on your opponent if you can get two or three more activations than your opponent. So with this plan, you just kind of ignore your opponent. Know that sometimes they will draw cards too, but you will draw cards so consistently that it'll still work to your advantage. So that's plan one. Plan two is kind of the opposite. Instead of making sure you draw cards every turn, you draw cards some turns, but make sure your opponent doesn't draw cards hardly at all. So instead of going on the discard your own hand plan and just drawing five out of five turns while your opponent draws two or three out of five turns, on this plan, you might only draw two or three out of every five turns with your Ori, but your opponent's going to draw zero or one. So the idea here is you just bounce stuff back to your opponent's hand. You got unsubstantiate, brutal expulsion, just to win. These are key because they're instant speed. So at the end of your turn, maybe your opponent plays some stuff to try to get empty handed to take advantage of ancestral recall ability. And you can just unsubstantiate their spell, bounce a creature back to their hand and because of that, they're going to miss out on drawing. Reflect Your Mage is awesome with this plan because it basically guarantees that your opponent isn't going to draw four two turns in a row. You cast Reflect Your Mage, bounce a creature. They miss their next draw from Guru Per Ori because they can't recast that creature. It's in their hand, so they have at least one card in hand. But then they also miss their next draw, too, because unless their creature has Flash, they won't be able to replay it until after Guru Per Ori would have triggered. So for one Reflector Mage, you can make your opponent miss two draws while you were theoretically drawing at least some of those turns. Being instant speed with all the spells is nice as well because you can always play them at the end of your opponent's turn just to get empty hand and draw some cards. So that's kind of the second plan. Instead of going for the 5 for 5 and your opponent on the 3 for 5 by discarding your own hand, this plan, you try to keep your opponent from drawing while you draw some amount of the time. So anyway, that's some ideas about how to use Gur Per Ori. That's some of the theory behind building around symmetrical cards. You're not going to be able to get all the advantage out of a card. Like you would if you cast a Doom Blade. You kill an opponent's creature, they lose their creature. That's 100% an advantage for you. With Gura Per Ori, it's about shifting the percentages. So maybe you're getting 75% of the advantage, your opponent's getting 25% of the advantage, but that 50% gap there is enough that it's going to help you win the game. So exploit the knowledge gap, use the knowledge that you have Gura Per Ori in your deck against your opponent because they don't know that, and exploit those percentages to gain an advantage and use that to win the game. Anyway, that's been our first Brewers Minute. Actually, more like Brewers 8 or 9 minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you want to see more of these. Thank you very much for watching, and I will talk to you soon.